<laughs> All right, webinar is live. Let me, hold on, I gotta share my screen. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen so that we can get going here and we'll wait a few minutes to let people in. I'm a savage, had a two nasty. Talk big, big, but my bank account match it. Hood, but I'm classy. Rich, but I'm ratchet. Haters kept my name in their mouth, not a gagging. Bougie. He say the way that thing move is a movie. I told that boy we gotta keep it lowly, me the room key. I done bled the block and now it's hot, hot, but tungy. I'm mood and I'm moody. I'm a savage. Classy, bougie, ratchet. Sassy, moody, nasty. Stupid, what was happening? What was happening? I'm a savage, classy, bougie, ratchet, sassy, moody, nasty, hacking, stupid, what was happening? Tick tock when I dance. dance on that demon time, she might start her only fans. Only fans. Big B and that B stand for bands. If you want to see some real, uh, baby, here's your chance. I say left cheek, right cheek, drop it low, then swing. Text is up in this thing, put you up on this game. I be parking my friends, gang, 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 gang. If you don't jump to put jeans on, baby, you don't feel my pain. Please don't give me hype. Write my name in ice. Can't argue with these lazy basics. I just raise my price. I'm a boss. I'm a leader. I pull up in my two seater, and my mama was a savage. Look, I got this here from Tina. I'm a savage. I think we should get started. Welcome everyone to the uh, first 
a session of the All Rays Seed Bootcamp. Uh, this will be a five week session. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we have uh, 361 participants so far, so I'm sure this is going to be a really great session. Okay, so let's see. Next slide. So just to tell you all a little bit about All Rays and who we are, uh, our mission is to accelerate the success of female founders and funders. And we believe that by improving success of women in the venture backed tech ecosystem, we can build a more accessible community that reflects the diversity of the world around us. Some of the goals of All Raise are to significantly increase the amount of seed through early stage funding going to female founders from 11% to 23% by 2030. And another goal is to double the percentage of female decision makers um, and funders in the US tech venture firms with uh, over 25 million in assets under management by 2028. So we have some lofty goals, but we can definitely get to that. Uh, All Raise is really run by, it's a nonprofit organization. There, a lot of us are volunteers uh, working together to bring you some programs. So uh, for this particular program, I've been working with an incredible group of women to put this together for you all and to curate some incredible speakers and some great content. So I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Bonnie Oliva Porter, and I run a consulting and coaching business called Amplify 11. And I'm a member of the All Rays Los Angeles uh, chapter and a member of that steering committee. We have Elisa Estrera, who is also on our, our team with the Seed Bootcamp and part of the LA chapter. She's a founder and lead product development consultant at Grapefruit Innovations. Uh, Kiki Mills Johnston, who is with our Boston chapter and is the managing director of Drive by DraftKings. And finally, Sophia Polyakov, who's with me on the LA steering committee uh, and is the CEO and co-founder of Noun Project and Lingo. And Sophia is going to be our moderator for today's session. So you'll be hearing from her very soon. So some info about today's session, uh, I'll be your uh, MC, your host, just kind of helping keep, tra keep track of timing and monitoring the chat and Q&A. Um, today's run of show is a SEEP Bootcamp overview. Um, we'll have the speakers for a bit. Uh, we'll do some Q&A, then we'll take a break. The speakers will come back and then we'll do another Q&A session. And uh, then we'll be doing some closing. And then there'll be some optional breakout rooms, networking discussion. Uh, after all of this for folks who want to stay on board and meet some of your other fellow cohort members. So if you have questions, uh, definitely make sure to put them in the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring that throughout the session and I'll be asking those to the panelists uh, when that time comes. If you have any uh, questions directed at a specific speaker, make sure to put that in the information there um, and then you can DM for any questions or concerns. So the SEED Bootcamp is consistent of five sessions, uh, going to be going through uh, most Tuesdays in October and one in November. Today's your first session with the um, topic being preparing your startup for SEED. Next week, we'll talk about what makes a great story in DEC. Uh, we'll have one on running the fundraise process, tips, best practices, and what not to do. Uh, mastering the pitch feed meeting, and then finally, understanding and negotiating a term sheet so that when you all get your funding in, uh, you're making sure that you do that correctly as well. So who is in the room? We have 481 folks participating in this uh, series. 75% of folks are first time founders, 59% people of color, and 36% parents. Uh, which is incredible. That's some incredible information. We uh, wanted to be very uh, specific about being as diverse and representative as possible. So when folks tell you that there isn't a pipeline or there isn't enough deal flow, you can just refer back to this and let them know we are making those changes happen as we speak. Uh, folks are from all over the United States with San Francisco, New York, and LA being the top. And then we also have folks uh, from all over the world from uh, different countries uh, throughout Africa, Asia, um, and Latin America. So in terms of the different companies that are going to be participating in this boot camp, we have uh, companies at different stages, 54% who have not received funding yet, 42% that have received angel funding, and 2% that have already received some seed funding. Uh, pretty evenly split amongst uh, where they are in terms of pre-product or products to market with revenue, products in market with some traction, uh, and then products in market uh, with, with 
pre-revenue. Uh, industry sector goes across the board as well. A lot of different sectors uh, here, health and wellness being the top, AI and machine learning as well. Uh, and then folks in different uh, parts of business and from you know social impact, uh, B2B, B2C, and B2B2C as well. And you'll get these slides afterwards, so you'll be able to take a look at this for those of you who are really interested in some of this data. Some fun facts, we have some uh, adrenaline junkies across uh, the board here in terms of our, our attendees. We have runners, cyclists, I won't go through all of this, but uh, definitely folks who love taking risks, uh, which is definitely in uh, shown in the fact that you're all starting businesses. So good luck to all of you and uh, hopefully we can all have some fun with this. So today's first session is preparing your startup for seed and I will hand it over to Sophia so she can introduce our speakers uh, and get, it, get us started. Sophia, you, you're up. Sorry, I had to reach the unmute button. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Bonnie, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Sophia Polikoff, and I'll be your panel moderator tonight. Uh, as Bonnie mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Noun Project. Sophia, I think we you're on mute. Um, can you I, hear me? I can hear her. Oh, okay. Yeah. You guys can hear me? Okay. Um, so as, as Bonnie mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Noun Project. We offer one of the largest and most comprehensive collections of icons and now photos, all curated through the lens of diversity and inclusion. Now, Noun Project has 7 million users and we've been profitable for a number of years now. But it was a very long and a very grueling road to get here, uh, which is why I'm so excited to share the knowledge of our panel with you guys tonight. Uh, 2020 has been a very rough year to say the least, but I honestly believe that the problems we're facing today would be greatly diminished if more women and more minorities were in the position of power whether that's in companies, in government, in entertainment, uh, anywhere that power exists. I believe that we need to make sure that the power dynamics in our country are more equal, which is why I really wanna thank you, all nearly 500 of you out there for showing up here today to learn and to lean in uh, when I'm sure you have a million other things that you could be doing and taking care of. So our goal tonight and throughout this entire series is to really empower you with the tools and the knowledge that you need to get to your next level so that in the future, you ladies out there are in the position of power and you can make an impact in the world. So let's get started by getting to know our amazing speakers. We have two investors today and two founders joining us. Uh, Tanya, let's start with you. If you can please uh, share your name, a little bit about your company, and just for fun, who did you want to be when you grow up? Hi, I'm Tanya Menendez. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Snowball Wealth. Um, we are a student debt management platform, so we help people understand their student debt and save money on it. And what I wanted to be, oh, and prior to this, I also started a B2B marketplace for factories called Makers Row. Um, what I wanted to be when I grew up was an ER doctor until I volunteered at a hospital. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Melody, let's have you go next. Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, Melody Co. I'm a partner at Next Few Ventures. Uh, we're a C-stage firm. I'm based in New York. We lead and co-lead seed investments, pre-seed, uh, most of the time companies pre-product market fit, focusing on what we call uh, the everyday economy, thinking about digital redesign of aspects of everyday people's lives. Um, most recently, before NextView, I was had a product at Blue Apron. I had a six, seven year stint uh, on the operating side before coming back to venture. And at Blue Apron, I led design, product, analytics, and data science through IPO. Um, what did I want to do when I grew up? Um, there was a brief period of time in high school that I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of a boring choice. 
Um, and then I realized that longer story, I was actually, I, I grew up in Taiwan and I had to come here for, for college. And when I realized I had to take a bunch of writing courses and I decided that was not, that was not a, not for me. Um, so I decided to pursue something um, equally boring, which is business. So that, that had treated me okay. But uh, that, that was the, I, I want, I thought I want to be a lawyer for about like a year in high school. Thank you. And Sue Lin, let's have you go next. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sue Lin. I'm the CEO of Cake. We help people navigate mortality, um, help them think about death and end of life, plan for it and deal with it. It's obviously a tough topic for a lot of us, but we try to make it easier and help guide people on what they need. Um, we've grown a lot over the last year, have started about a year ago, direct to consumer with almost no organic traffic. Today we have more than 2 million people coming to our site every month. Um, all organic. So that's been really incredible. Um, and we're working with a lot of um, healthcare, health systems, as well as people, um, the companies in the financial sector. Uh, we've raised, just so for the context of the conversation today, we've raised um, some angel money and in two institutional rounds. Um, I, I, when I, when I was younger, I always thought I would go into some, one of the creative arts, but I'm just not good enough at anything. <laughs> to actually have done that. But I do think that entrepreneurship is intensely creative. So I, it definitely scratches that itch. Um, yeah, it's a funny question. <laughs> Complete, I completely agree with that. Uh, Suzanne, you're, you're next. Sure, hi, I'm Suzanne Norris. Um, I'm one of the managing partners and founders of Victress Capital. And Victress is a venture capital firm and we invest in early stage consumer companies that have gender diverse teams. Um, and I think everyone on this call probably knows the stats, but we do that um, not because we think it's the right thing to do for society, because it certainly is. But when you look at the data and you start to drill down uh, companies at all stages uh, that have men and women on the leadership team outperform those top line and bottom line, no matter who studies that. We've, we've, we've read dozens of studies and so, we felt like, um, you know, it's the right thing to do to back women, but it's also a very smart thing to do uh, in terms of, you know, earning great return your money. So that's Victress. Um, let's see, prior to Victress, I had uh, various operating roles within consumer companies. Uh, Kate Spade was probably the largest one that I was at for a while. I was always on the e-commerce side, always in the operations side. I don't really have a creative bone in my body. So it was really fun to work at all those different brands. Um, but my skills, I was definitely more on the boring business side. Um, and what did I want to be? <laughs> Oddly, for a long time, I wanted to be an international spy. <laughs> and my, my family still, I think even back then they were like, are you kidding? <laughs> so are I, you I, an international spy, Suzanne? No, is there something I, we don't know? I am definitely not. This is your cover up. Yeah, this is my cover. This is, uh, this is my cover. I find great women to back to hide behind my cover. But um, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know where that, I don't have no idea how that led me to business. But anyway, I, I have always, um, I have been in, I have my MBA. And so since then had, like I said, operating roles and investing roles and um, really excited to be part of Allraise. I mean, as a firm that kind of has this as core to their mission, um, we have met with some tremendous founders over the last five years. And it's just exciting to see that Allraise is, you know, really taking off and bringing all of you together and giving you the resources and access that you all deserve. Well said. So at first I wanna kind of have an overview of why and why not raise capital? You know, we have about 75% of the women that are on the call today uh, that are first time founders that have never raised capital and may not be familiar with it. So um, Melody, I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind. When we last chatted, you had this really, um, interesting thing that you said. You said institutional capital. Do you want to get on that train? Um, do you care to expand a little bit more on that? Sure. Um, I like I like the opening cold call of the of the panelists. I didn't actually know I was going to literally go first. Um, you know, so so when we we did a prep session for this last week, and when we we're talking about raising capital, um, I usually, you know, a lot of founders, a lot of their friends who, you know, naturally now I'm a VC, people come to me and ask about, hey, you know, usually the number one question is like, hey, what metrics do I need to get to to get money from you, essentially? That kind of question, which we'll address later. And I was like, hold on. First of all, like most businesses should not raise venture capital. And the way I usually describe to people is that 
if you raise from institutional investors, i.e. Uh, people who do this professionally for a living, and you know, Suzanne and I, we have a fund that is other people's money that are called limited partners. And they give money to, for us to manage because they want to drive to a specific type of return. So when you raise, even though if you're, you know, raised from a C stage fund, fund size is smaller, or you know, a later stage fund, the fund size is much larger. Regardless, when you raise money from institutional investors, you, you, you know, I kind of get to talk about it, like getting on the institutional train because then you're on a different trajectory and expectations for a different trajectory. So I actually think the number one question is to really think about. Do you want to get on that train? And we can also talk about like what kind of expect expectations is that. But roughly, I would say, generally speaking, for institutional investors, they have to be able to imagine that you can get to some kind of a roughly called billion dollar outcome. And if you feel like your market and product, and this is like what you think you're interested in getting at for a high growth trajectory, then it is completely fine and good to, to chase this path of venture capital broadly defined. Or you can raise from non-institutional investors, which are more like family offices, angels, high net worth individuals, uh, because if you 10x their money, they're gonna be really, really happy. And you don't really have that same level of pressure to really kind of grow and, 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 and run at that kind of trajectory. So I think that's actually the number one thing to think about. Um, whether that's the trajectory you want to get on. And Celine, as somebody who has gotten on that train, um, do you want to add your thoughts about why you've decided to raise capital? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, the advice that a lot of people give, which I think is good advice, is if you can make money and not, don't have to raise, that's, you know, that preserves a lot of optionality for you and a lot of independence. And that's definitely the way to go if you can do it. Um, I felt like I, I needed some money at the start to help build what we are, what we have, the product. Um, and I think one thing that I did want to bring up is just how the media covers these types of, um, companies, covers companies in general. And it's often so focused on these big fundraising stories and you don't get a lot of coverage about bootstrapped companies that are crushing it. Um, and so I think that there, and I think that we internalize that even if we know on some level that um, there's different ways to achieve success. So I do think um, for us, we knew we wanted to be, you know, the consumer brand for death and end of life. We wanted to build this big platform. We needed to build a product in order to sell it. And I couldn't do it myself. So I had to convince people to do it. So that is kind of where I got to in terms of wanting to, to raise funds, but it's not, it's definitely not for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Um, Tanya, now you've, you've started two companies now and both have been venture backed. Um, so you had some really great advice that you shared with me about, uh, you know, pushing back more and taking advice with a grain of salt. Um, is there anything else that, <laughs> that you'd like to share with, with the founders today? <clears throat> yeah. And I actually, my very first company was bootstrapped. It was a leather goods line and, um, it was really fun. It was probably the most fun because there is not a lot of expectations, not a lot of pressure and really, really could decide, make decisions on our own. Um, and I think that what Melody was saying about the pressure and the expectations really holds true. Um, I know that for Makers Row, when we raised two and a half million for Makers Row from institutional investors and um, with that came a lot of opinions, a lot of advice, a lot of expectations. And, um, and then especially if it's your first time building a company, it can be easy to take that, those pieces of advice and those suggestions um, without, um, you know, and implementing them, um, even if it goes against like what you you know, what your best judgment is. And so um, I would just say, like, make sure that you evaluate the investors that you bring on as like extension of your team. And that these are people that um, you would trust their judgment on. Um, and, um, and then definitely take their advice with a grain of salt. I, th I think that's very solid advice. Um, and especially uh, being you know, on the younger side and being a woman, sometimes we tend to think that somebody else has all the answers and knows it all. But really, I think 
in the founder seat, you're the one that knows your business the best. Um, so, so while advice is certainly welcomed and, and should always be considered, I think that having that judgment is always um, very important. Um, so the next thing I really want to talk about uh, briefly is what types of instruments can be used for early stage funding. And I say we're going to um, dive into it very briefly just because we cover this more in depth in session five. But I think it's important to have an overview. Um, so Suzanne, would you mind just giving us an overview of what uh, instruments are available for early stage funding? Sure, um, and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I think just building off the last um, conversation, I think it's really important to know why you're raising the money. Um, because I do think like what Sulan said, there's so much buzz about raising money, raising money as if that's the sign of success, but that's just where it begins. So you need to raise the money, but then have a plan of what you're going to do with the money because the investors are going to expect that you're going to return it, to, uh, you know, do what you say you're going to do and follow your plan and eventually return it to them. And so I think having a really clear plan of why you need this money and why you need it now is helpful. And then in terms of how you can get the money, um, which is this question, the, the there's sort of four buckets of capital, if you will. There's friends and family money. Um, and really that can be a loan or a gift. <laughs> it's great if it's a gift <laughs> and, and they don't have any expectation in their term, but I think most people um, you know, give it to you with the expectation it's a loan. And if you're talking about a loan, you um, anytime you're talking about a loan, you definitely should seek some advice from a lawyer, but you can structure that very formally. Um, and in the VC world, you'd be structuring a loan in either, um, uh, convertible debt, um, which I'll get into in a second, but you could, so you have friends and family money, which can be a gift or a loan. Um, you can have something, you can raise money through what's called a safe, which I think Y Combinator has been a big, um, it's been very popular with them. That safe is actually an acronym for simple agreement for future equity. So you are giving, um, you are taking money from your investors, which will convert into equity at some point in the future. There is no defined time and there is no defined interest or anything like that. It's just a promise that their money will turn into equity at some point. Um, then there's a convertible note and that's debt. Um, so that's a very specific time frame. Usually it's two years, a very specific interest rate. Typically it's 8% and it gets triggered. That debt turns into equity when there's a trigger event. And typically you, that's a, a qualified financing. And if you're a, a growth startup, usually that note is a two-year window. And I, as me as the investor and you as a founder, believe that you'll go raise money again before the two years so that that money will roll into equity. You won't be paying back investors um, on that loan. Um, and then lastly, you can do an equity price round, but that's really further along. I mean, it's really hard for founders to price the valuation of their company when you're pre-seed or pre-launch or anything like that. It's just, it's very hard to do. So I don't know if we've seen, well, maybe we've seen one or two, but the large majority of, um, of uh, instruments that we see with founders raising their seed round um, are often a convertible note or safe. Um, Thank you. I just ask something quickly here um, about the valuation thing. I actually think it's a little bit of a misnomer that when you're raising on a convertible note or safe, you don't price because the reality is that you do. Because there's this thing called, if you go on the YC safe documentation, most companies raise on a cap. A valuation cap is effectively a notion of price even though it's not exactly. Um, and, and convertible note also has a cap. If you're a founder, if you're Jack Dorsey, you can probably raise on an uncapped note, but <laughs> if you're everybody else, you probably cannot. Um, so I actually think, you know, sometimes founders go into the go into this non-priced round thinking that, oh, so I don't have to price. And that's, I think that's absolutely false. The true benefit is in theory, speed and legal fees. But the caveat there is also that there are two types of C stage documents. For example, the one we use usually is seriesc.com modified documents, which are way slimmer of a pack than MVCA document. MVCA stands for National Venture Association, blah, blah, blah. Like those documents are heavier. So there's, there's like on the spectrum, there's also like what you can do when it comes to legal costs and speed. Uh, but it is true that the ultimate if you can just like generate a generic document and like fill in DocuSign and do it in a day, that's called safe. And then like incrementally gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah, thank you for that, Melody. 
Um, and for, for all the founders out there, we'll also be sending you an email after this session with more information because I know that this is a lot to take in. Um, and so there is a lot of good information available out there as well on this. Um, so Melody, I'm actually glad that you mentioned Jack Dorsey because when, when we did our prep call, you said that you had this, um, this, this amazing spectrum of how fancy a team is, which I think Jack Dorsey is pretty fancy. Well, um, I actually use Elon Musk as an example. Well, prep, you know, so. yeah, but either way, um, versus how much traction you need to show. And so I think that this is a nice segue into talking about what investors look for. Yeah. So, um, going back to the, by the way, if there's a screaming toddler in the background, I apologize. Um, he, uh, so, you know, the, the way I, the number one question I get, um, and I'm sure Suzanne, you get this a lot too, which is, okay, so what metric do I need to hit to raise my round or what metrics do I need for next view to invest? Like a variation of that. Um, and I usually kind of not answer that question. I say, okay, so here's kind of the relation on traction. If you imagine on a spectrum, on this end, it's called non-fancy founding team. On this end, it's called fancy founding team. And the most extreme example, let's just use Jack Dorsey example. If Jack Dorsey says, I'm going to start a company called X, he doesn't even have a deck. He can get 10 million bucks behind him tomorrow. Zero traction. So, so, so the way I usually describe this is, is that like, that's just kind of the reality of life. So it depends on where you are on that spectrum. The more you, you're like, the, the less fancy you are, and I'll go into the second and describe what fanciness means. And by the way, this is just like a simple term. It can be like founder market fit or whatnot, but just to capture people's imagination. So I think that the, the less fancy the team looks like, the more you need to prove. So thus get into the traction equation. So, but I think everything's relative. Now, okay, what does that mean? And this is going to the, the three things that, you know, people usually look for on the investor side um, when it comes to founding a startup, the market, the team and the product. And I'm just gonna focus on teams so other people can kind of chime in here. Usually I'll say we think about two things. One is what we call founder market fit for a specific market that you're going after we tend to go to this slide on the founding team. We're like, okay, what does this team have in terms of experience or, you know, either industry experience or functional experience that really put them in a unique position to solve this problem. And sometimes the answer to that could be like none. You're just really good and you figure something out, but sometimes it can be very relevant and that obviously, that obviously helps. And the other thing I would call it is just like, general exceptionalness that kind of a signal that people can get from looking at your past experience, whether it's high career trajectory or work that company that have scaled, you know, quote unquote winning companies. Um, and that just gives people comfort that this is a team that can execute. Obviously that doesn't mean you actually can and vice versa. Like that also doesn't mean that you didn't come from a fancy background, you can't execute, but the burden of proof then is more on you. So thus, kind of in my mind, the spectrum of that relationship, uh, you know, how much you need to prove in relation to like how your team background can be perceived without investors spending too much time with you or any time at all. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah, um, Tanya, I, you had some great points about taking the time to observe how people in the industry talk about their company um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, fundraising, a big part of fundraising is also the storytelling piece. And in that, I think it's important to understand um, the market that you're in. So for example, the story that I was telling for Makers Row, it was a B2B company, it was a marketplace. So there's um, certain things that investors look for in a B B2B and in marketplace. Whereas with my new company, it's fintech and it's direct to consumer. And so it's a completely new landscape. And so what I did as I was preparing for raising funding for this company was under, like reaching out to other fintech founders, understanding what investors look for, for specifically B2C fintech, um, because it can be pretty different. It was very different from what they looked for on a B2B marketplace. Um, 
And, and then I think that understanding the language and the culture of like the area that you're working in can help polish your pitch and give a little bit more confidence to the investors that you can execute. Yeah, for sure. Um, Suzanne, do you want to add to, to that from a, an investor's perspective in terms of what you look for? Um, I think, I think everything Melody said was really like, if you're a seed investor, there is very little to invest in other than the team at that moment, right? Most of these companies haven't launched, uh, or if they have launched, it's maybe three months. So you're really making the bet that the team has found a large market that has a problem to solve and they have a product or service to do it. But the bet is that they can execute because you can analyze a market size and you can analyze a product like that part's. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is deciding whether is this a team that can actually do what they say they're going to do, um, because that's where businesses fall apart. And so I think we try to spend as much time as we can understanding that. And, and it's hard, especially hard in COVID, right? Where you're not in the companies, you're not meeting with them. So for us, we really look to understand what has the founder done prior to this Um like I just said, like my favorite phrase is, have you done what you said you were going to do before in life? Like, give me some examples of that and not the easy ones. Give me an example where it wasn't going right. And how did you, you know, how did you evolve? And that that's the kind of stuff you need to believe they can pull off. Cause it's, cause all the founders, you guys know, I mean, it's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. <laughs> and so um, we want to know that you've got the ability, the skill set, the team, the drive to push it through and get there um, and, and execute because that's that's the bet we're making on on you all at the seed stage. I don't know, Melanie, if you'd add to that, but that's certainly our perspective on the um, what we're looking at. Yeah, totally. And I, I don't want like the, the description of fanciness to be interpreted the wrong way. I think in general, there just means like signals and evidence that we can discern as much as, you know, just by looking at someone, what someone has done in life to figure out. And the reason Jack Dorsey can get 10 million bucks behind him without a slide deck is because he's done a lot. So people, you know, like ha having started a company helps, right? Having executed to a certain scale helps. Having been part of a growth story and see how companies scaled and how millions of customers uh, are acquired and, and building products and all these things help. Um, the only other thing I'll add is like, you know, we think actually a lot back to the team because team is actually the, 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 you know, market is probably the most important because if you're in a small market, it's very hard to maneuver, but then certainly follows as a team. And thirdly, it's a product at the C stage because, you know, like Suzanne said, a lot of people don't even have the product out. If so, you have very little actual data. So, you know, a lot of the focus is on team. The only thing I will add is like, when founders try to package your own story and like why you're the right team, you want to think about like, what are the key, like, what are the key ingredients that will make this particular business model successful. For example, um, we have a portfolio company in B2B SaaS uh, in marketing technology. And you know, we think the superpower that will make this type of business model successful is sales. So we got excited when the founding team of this company, the CEO specifically, has a really strong sales background. And versus a consumer social company, that's, in my opinion, that kind of business needs really unique product chart. So if you come from like, I'm a business model wizard, you're not going to really, it's really hard to convince people you're going to build a successful consumer social company. So I would just think about like what, from an investor's perspective, what are the key ingredients that will make this company go and try to package your background to highlight that to the extent that you have that kind of functional chops or even just like relevant past experience uh, doing something like that. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, so something that early stage founders face a lot um, is, is this challenge of kind of chicken and the egg, right? So you need to show traction in order to raise, but a lot of times you need capital in order to show traction. So it's kind of like you know, as a founder, you're left in this conundrum in terms of how to navigate that. Um, Sue so Lynn, I just wanted to, to start with you. How did you go about navigating showing traction for your product? Yeah, um, well, I guess I, I think we, and we talked about this in the prep, but I think that, um, I think when I first started, I thought that the story would be, I would put together a great 
pitch deck, I would raise money, then build the product and then raise more money. And it just never goes like that. And when I talk to other women founders, I feel like the, the paths are always much, you know, less clean and you can always revise in hindsight how things happened. But it's, I felt like it's much more a raise a little money here, build something, prove something, then use that proof to raise a little bit more. And it's not like a straight road. It can be very, it can be very challenging. And I think, um, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that I think what Melody was is saying is completely right about the fancy founders, but I did want to acknowledge that I think as women, a lot of us just, a lot of people on this call probably just don't feel like they're in that category, even if they're amazing, right? And it's part of it, you know, present company excluded, um, probably a lot of investors just don't see you as a fancy founder, even if you are very fancy, they may just not see it, unfortunately. So I think that, you know, um, I think a lot of, I think comparing yourself to how other people have done can be really discouraging. So I definitely, um, you know, would, would say that again, like when you read about startups in the news, you have to know that a lot of that was revised in hindsight about how it actually went. So I guess just to say that, you know, for the chicken and egg problem, it's, it's often much messier um, and that's really normal. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And I completely agree. Reading TechCrunch, you would think that everybody's got it made and everybody's just out there closing deals, making it happen when really it's, it is a lot messier behind the scenes. Um, Tanya, you had, you had a really interesting point that you made during our call about finding um, investors that already have the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, do you wanna talk about that in relation to your company? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I know Melody was talking about the burden of proof. And I think that there are instances in which you find investors that have a similar worldview and have been thinking about this problem and banging their head against this problem and want to see an idea like this come to life. And for them, um, I think that it's an easier yes. Um, and usually the burden of proof can be a little lower. And so my suggestion for those thinking about angel investors or institutional investors is finding investors that are a good fit for you and that already have been thinking about the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so for me, the investors that said yes pretty quickly were ones that were already thinking about you know, financial empowerment for women, that were already thinking about student debt and that had this problem in their head already. And their portfolio also showed that. Um, and so I think that finding investors that already match your worldview, I think is important. Um, and then I also think that in terms of the burden of proof, some investors want different <laughs> metrics. So not there's not one number that's going to satisfy everyone. And um, you know, some investors want top of the um, top of the funnel metrics. Some people want higher engagement, some people want in conversion metrics, and some people want retention and cohort analysis. And so every investor is going to want a different number. I think it's important to find the number that you think is the most important to prove the success of your business and really focus on that one. Yeah, so I think unfortunately as a founder, you really have two jobs that you have to do. Not only are you founding your own company and dealing with all the messy um, things that come with, with a startup in the early days, especially, but you also have this other job of doing research on potential investors that you want to do business with, of networking, of trying to cater your pitch to make sure that it's um, hitting the right audience at the right time with the right message. Um, so it's, it, it is a lot of work. Um, and, and on that positive note, we're going to jump into the Q&A with, with Bonnie. Yes, the folks are asking some really great and incredible questions in the Q&A. And just to um, just kind of go back to what Tanya was saying, there was a, a question around how do you, a couple of questions around how exactly do you go about finding investors who could be a good fit? Or what are some tactical strategies for the folks on this call to start looking for who they should pitch to? Um, I can take a stab at it uh, and everybody else, please chime in. Actually, I just on, on the note of Tanya, what, what Tanya just said, um, I usually describe it's fundraising as, um, you know, it's not, it's not about convincing skeptics. 
is about finding true believers. And you want to kind of think about that because it can be very frustrating and it is a freaking funnel. So you can like, your top of funnel can be a hundred and the conversion is one, you know, that's 1% conversion, which is pretty good. But like, in some cases it's pretty bad, right? So like you it, it prepare mind and personal biases, levels of conviction about certain topics and issues. It is all the way down to the randomness factors of who, who are the other four pitches that this investor heard this week? I literally, I was talking to someone else about it, which we might get into this in the second half. I was like, your, your first meeting, you're just competing to get this investor to do work. And like, you're trying to create a mental space to be like, oh, this is kind of intriguing. I need to like dig in for 15 minutes because if they don't, there's no flipping the next card. So I just want to put it out there because it can feel very frustrating. So now you're, the next question is like, okay, how do I know who actually thinks about this? You know, some investors um, put a lot of content out there. So like we as a firm, we put a lot of content out there. So it's actually really easy to kind of figure out how we think about the world. Um, I mean, there's a lot of homework, but I think it just takes time as a founder to really just over time, understanding the landscape and slicing and dicing the, you know, institutional investors in a few different ways. One is by stage, uh, C stage, series A, beyond. And usually there are two categories of firms, seed, seed only firms and multi-stage firms. And then within the seed firms, there are two classes of them. One is called people who lead and one is called people who don't lead. And usually you want to focus your energy on finding the lead because everybody else is going to be like, oh, this sounds great. Let me hang around the hoop. Well, they're not going to say that, but that's what they're doing. Or let me, you know, keep my options open until you like identify the lead. Um, for a variety of different reasons, lacking their own conviction or that's not a business model. So I usually advise people to like over time, really figure out who the lead investors are and spend most of your energy on that. Not to say not to have a conversation with everybody else, but otherwise your, your process is going to be very dragged out. The next question is, okay, how do I actually know who these people are? I mean, simple things is just like reading, you know, daily newsletter, like term sheets, you just get familiarized with who the names are. And, you know, if your very first round even if you're not ultra connected in a space, if you're very first round, you get one or two advisors or angel investors who are ex-founders, they can help you a lot because they, they have gone, this, gone through this before um, and they can help you make introductions. They can help you like, don't waste time with X, you know, talk to Y. And once you get to see an investor, you know, like us or like Suzanne, then they, you, we can help you figure out like, oh yeah, this partner at this firm, does this, this, they're going to waste your time. They're going to take five weeks. They just invest in a competitor. So like once you get an institutional investor behind you, this process going forward become much easier. But I say like the very, very first batch is going to be more difficult because you're not as familiar. And I think finding even allies who are not officially on the cap table, but are ex-founders or current founders who have experience navigating this, they can just save you a lot of time and identify who the good guys are in this space and who are people who spend time or want to invest in categories like that. And then it's just, unfortunately, just a really wide top of the funnel because you're 15 minutes into first call, you're just going to know. You're just going to know whether this investor gets there or not. And if they don't do work in the next five days, this is like a dead lead. So just, you know, move on and like kind of continue, uh, turn through uh, some of these names until you find the true believer. Yeah, I was just going to quickly jump in and say, I think there's a lot of homework you can do, see what their portfolios are like, and definitely stage fit and everything. But uh, one of our investors told me, there's nothing, you can't get around just kissing a lot of frogs. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, two additional notes on that, more subtle. One is, you know, a lot of people will like look at portfolios, so this can cut both ways. So it'd be like, oh, because you're investing X, Y, Z, you must want to add X1 and Y1. <laughs> That might or might not be true. Just because, so, so the there, there reason right now that might be true. One is that X was a loser, so I don't want X1. Two is that I'm overexposed because I have X and X1 and X2, so I don't want X3, especially if they're in the same fund. So, so that can cut both ways. And I would just caution people for like discerning too much because you don't really know the history and you don't know the timeline of those investments. Um, so I won't overly bank on that. The, the, the second more subtle note is depending on the firm, some firms are a bunch of uh, kind of long range wolves and they don't really talk to each other. So talking to partner A at Firm X can be very different than talking to partner B at Firm X. It is totally okay to talk to partner A 
and then again, talk to partner B. But you want to make sure when you talk to partner B, you said, I've already talked to partner A, you know, what is the background? Because otherwise the partner B is going to think that you're trying to like skirt around partner A. And then if they communicate they're like, oh, we saw this company already. Uh, but I, I, I still think that this is a very personal decision a lot of times, investment, especially early stage. So it doesn't really mean, especially for a large firm, like multi-stage firm that is more of a platform firm with 20 partners on their home, on their website. Uh, you just want to be transparent uh, to you know, communicate that you've already talked to so-and-so at this firm to make sure there is connected uh, tissue and continuity on the context. Yeah, I'll add one more thing um, to that too. And I think that for me, the best introductions have been from other founders mm -hmm. in the space. Um, but it's also important to be open. Like one of our investors I met on Twitter, another one I met, you know, sitting on a flight <laughs> and she was one of the first checks. And so I think that it's definitely important to be open and also to stay in touch and ask and let them know, hey, I'm starting to fundraise now. Would you be open to jumping on a call? I think that's, I, I know there's a whole session on fundraising, but if I would add anything, it's getting comfortable with the ask. Um, like we just closed our own fund a couple of months ago and, and I don't consider myself a salesperson and I hate asking, <laughs> but we had to get really, really comfortable with it because, you know, I don't know, you have to take a couple of hundred meetings to get the money. And for everybody in this call, your entrepreneurs, your go-getters, your type A by nature, like you're not used to not you know, having 99% success rate on things. So yeah. get comfortable that you're probably going to have a 5% hit rate on these investor conversations and that's okay. But if you don't make the ask, you won't, you won't get enough numbers out. It's really a volume game um, to some extent. And once, you know, once you find your lead or once you find a handful of investors that will be a reference call for you or help reach into their networks, um, it'll get going, but don't get discouraged because it, it, it's, it is really difficult to start another day when you just had a couple of no's, but you know, hang in there and really lean heavy on your network and definitely get comfortable making the ask. Okay, I think um, we have to just take a quick break now and we will come back with part two of our bootcamp and more Q and A towards the end, but we've gotten a lot of really great questions. We'll give everyone a uh, quick break and we'll be back shortly. I do my hair toss, check my nails, baby, how you feeling? Let it go to the hair toss, check my nails, baby, how you feeling? Let it go to the Ooh, child, tired of the bullshit, gone, dust your shoulders off, keep it moving, yes, Lord, trying to get some new shit in there, swimwear, going to the pool shit. Come now, come dry your eyes, you know you a star, you can touch the sky. I know that it's hard, but you have to try. If you need advice, let me simplify.
just enjoying that music i know i was like let's let's it's time to get very back. slick timer <laughs> that you got there Bonnie, you got to say where it came from what the oh the timer yeah <laughs> it's it's from uh youtube <laughs> just <laughs> oh i thought you said it was used at your kids uh at, at, at your little oh, I think it was preschool Kiki. Uh, Kiki. oh no Kiki. we dropped yeah, out of online sorry. Well, we weren't going to do that. He's two. <laughs> it was a mess. Um, all right. So I think we are ready to get back to act two. Oh, actually, I told everyone at, at five. So it, we have two more minutes. One more minute. One more minute. Got it. I guess my timer was not long enough. Hopefully it got everybody back in in their All right, five o'clock my time, 8 p.m. East Coast time. We're ready to roll for part two. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, just wanted to point out that as of right now, we have over 60 questions that have come in last time that I checked. Um, unfortunately, we will not have time to answer all of them, but the good news is that a lot of them will be covered in our future sessions. Uh, just in, in terms of saving time right now, we're gonna keep moving and then we'll have another 15 minutes uh, towards the end of this session for more questions. Uh, so the next thing that I would like to talk about is a very big topic of how much to fundraise. Um, I remember a few years ago, some investors have mentioned, you know, you're raising for 12 to 18 months of runway. Uh, but more recently, the investors I've spoken to say that that is just not enough. You need to raise for at least 18 to 24 months, uh, certainly to hit your milestones. Um, and in particular with the instability of our current economic situation, it's, it's better to have more in the bank uh, rather than less. Um, so Suzanne, let's let's start with you. Uh, what are your recommendations for how founders should think about how much to fundraise? 
Uh, well, I think it kind of built off of, sorry, just hit my desk. Uh, it built off what we said earlier that I think you, you need to know what you're raising money for. And I think, you know, investors are going to ask you that very quickly, like, okay, you want to raise a million, what are you going to do with a million? So what's the, you know, the allocation, um, and we'll dig down into that really deeply. So for instance, if you're saying you're raising a million and you're going to spend 90% on marketing, that gives me concern. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want 90% of that spend. I want to know that you're building a team. I want to know that you have some, if you're a B2C company with a product or service, that you've got milestones about how that product is developing, where it's headed. So, um, so I think answering the question of what are you raising the money for is very important because that'll give you a sense of how much money do you need to achieve those things. And then I do think 18 to 24 months is, is in this environment, you know, with the election coming up, potentially another round of COVID coming um, as a consumer, I'm a consumer investor. So I, I am, you know, admittedly nervous, like what is going to happen? Maybe we'll weather through this just fine, but there definitely is this, we're headed into another six months of uncertainty. And so if you know milestones you need to hit to in, as a seed stage company to hit the miles, you know, sorry, to hit the milestones you need to get to the next round, just give yourself a cushion. Cause the last thing you want to do is be midway through those proof points and need to go to market again to raise more money because you just didn't have enough. Um, so I'll stop. To, I'll let everyone else chime in, but that's sort of one one big point. What know what you're raising the money for and how long that money will last you, and then add a little bit of a cushion on it. Yeah, Melody, do you want to comment on on that? Yeah. So in general, you know, I agree that kind of the new best practice advice is eighteen to twenty four because. Because of the uncertainty we have in economic cycle that we're in um, midstream with everything developing, you know, people probably feel like, oh, the market slash the environment is changing every two weeks. Every two weeks we get new information, especially when COVID first hit, right? Now it's probably slightly less dramatic of a pace, change of pace. So yes, in a perfect world, people want to sit on more runway because then you got, especially if you're a pre-product market fit company, you have more time to experiment. You can learn and you can buy yourself more time to get to the proof point you need. Now, we're not in a perfect world and nobody has always has luxury. So the next thing to consider is, and the other thing I wanna call out, um, most people underestimate how long it takes to fundraise. So I, I usually use an illustrative example um, and I'm gonna go quick. So let's say you're, you run a perfect process. You line up all introductions to send to 20 investors in week one. You get me first meeting scheduled in week two. You get someone in a partner meeting in week three. You get a term sheet in week four. And by the way, this is a perfect process. And you negotiate a term sheet for one week. You sign in in week five. You start talking to everybody else to fill out your syndicate week six. Week seven, lawyers start working on their docs. And week A, potentially you're ready to close. Give one more week, week nine for a wire to hit your bank. And let's just call it 10 weeks. And that's a perfect process. Nobody runs that. Um, so, you know, a lot of times, minimally, I tell people you can take three months from the very first meeting to money hitting the bank. In fact, a lot of times it takes longer because we talked about earlier, you got to kiss a lot of frogs. So the frog kissing takes a while because it's scheduling. And if investors don't feel like this thing is going to get done in the next 48 hours, they're probably deprioritized on their calendar. So you, you don't get a meeting until a week later. And then they take their sweet time to do work and this and that because investors are always trying to prioritize what they seem to be more urgent. So I just want to put it out there because that impacts how you think about runway. So then you're like, okay, if I raise a 12 month runway, what does that mean? That means you come back in a fundraising market in six months. You got no time to build your company. So you're like constantly fundraising. So that's why people say at least 18 months if possible. Now, what if you can't? The, the, only, the other thing to think about is every company has, you know, if you graph an X, Y graph, X is a timeline and Y is like called company progress or milestone generically defined. Most companies don't have a linear path like that. Most companies have like step, I want to call step function unlock. Like you're flat for a while and then suddenly you unlock something and you hit like a local maximum for a minute. And then you're like, your slope goes up and down. Generally trajectory is going up, but it's not linear. So it's your job to think about, you know, based on your product roadmap, your beta launch or whatever, your major partnership, signing pilot customer number one, two, three for a B2B company. Like where, 
you know, kind of overlap on top of a lean a calendar and be like, oh, this is where I'm going to be in the strongest position to package my story. And so, so that th those are all the things to take into consideration. And the very the one last thing I'll throw it out there is that most of the companies here are early stage. And these days, compared to 10 years ago, these days it's very common for companies to raise more than one round of seed financing. That's why people have this like, oh, we're raising a free seed and then we're going to raise another seed. It, it's, it, my partner, Dave, wrote a blog post a while ago called the atomization of seed. So there are like a bunch of different paths to get to Series A. But a lot of times this is no longer stigmatized to have required two rounds of financing to get to Series A. How those two rounds get chunked out is a little different for everybody. And you can be really successful and you can go straight to series A, but I just also want to call it out because that also impacts planning of how you think about runway and amount. Melody, do you mind, um, I also saw this as one of the questions that came in. Do you mind explaining what is pre-seed versus seed? Okay, so um, first of all, there's like no official definition and I'll give a few um, iterations of what I've seen. This, first of all, is not even a thing three years ago. Um, it used to just be called friends and family round. And we now have a thing called pre-seed round. So usually pre-seed pre means a few, th few things. One is people think of it as like a pre-launch. You're like a pre-product company. So by definition, you're a pre-seed. Now, the other criteria I usually say is like a million dollar round size or less. If you tell me you're raising a $2 million pre-seed, I'm just gonna laugh my face off because I just think that's kind of a joke. Um, you can't really call a $2 million round a pre-seed round despite your pre-product. Um, the third thing, which is kind of a also a little bit of a given, but not an official definition is that when I think of a pre-seed, I think of a company with mid single digit valuation. So if you're raising a $3 million round at a 12 post, I'm not gonna call it a pre-seed. And that, and the, the last thing I would say is it kind of doesn't matter because you call it whatever you want. The next time investor talk to you, I'm going to ask, okay, tell me about your funding history. And you're going to be like, oh, we raised $3 million 18 months ago. And what I'm going to do in math in my head is like, oh, okay. So you took 18 months and 3 million bucks. So do I think you're overachieved or underachieved given that resource? So that's really the only thing that matters, not the nomenclature of whatever you call it, because the resource and time that you put into this company is going to push investors' expectation of where you should be. So that's more important than what you call these rounds. But generally speaking, it's like sub million dollar, low single digit valuation. A lot of times it's pre launch company or just launched. Thank you. I'm not sure, for Suzanne, if you have a different set of definitions. Um, well, we, so again, after this call, we will be sending out an email with some resources. And one of the, the books that helped me years ago uh, when I was fundraising, and I think it's very, very relevant today, and it's been updated many times, is Venture Deals by Brad Feld. And hopefully that will explain this in much more detail. Um, so that'll be a good resource for everyone to have as well. Um, Tanya, so since this is your second company, I, I believe you mentioned that you raised a little bit less because you wanted less dilution and, and more autonomy. Do you mind speaking to that a little bit? Yes. And I was also more intentional about the people that I wanted to be a part of this. So I focused the majority of my time on investors that could help us with marketing and with user growth, um, because as a B2C FinTech company, that was important to me. And so, um, yeah, and I definitely, in my experience in raising institutional rounds, there's just, it's a lot, much longer process. There's more due diligence. Um, it can just take much longer to complete. And so, um, and there's just a lot more expectations around it. And so um, that's when I decided to, to focus and to raise less in the, in the beginning um, and then make it more intentional also. Um, and Silen, how did you go about considering how much to raise for your company? 
I mean, I think it, the best way is always to think about the milestones you want to hit and work backwards. Although that can be really hard because I'm sure that everyone has, well, this is my plan for if I raise 500,000, this is my plan if I raise a million. But, and I think that that's also really normal. So, but I think you trying to think about what are the inflection points that have a material impact on the value of your company or what's the most important thing to de-risk and what do you need to kind of achieve that? Um, and I will also say that, um, you know, I think that in general valuation, and I think Melody also has mentioned this before, in general valuation is kind of, it falls within a particular range for every round that you do, no matter how much money you raise. And so I think it's probably more, much more important to focus on who you want to work with, like really think of this as a long-term relationship as opposed to optimizing for valuation. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so to that end, Suzanne and Melody, I'm going to ask you a question that I'm guessing a lot of founders here are thinking about, but it's not widely discussed in tech, at least not that I've seen, um, which is, is it appropriate to set aside salary for founders when raising a seed round? Um, you know, not everybody's in the position of having uh, family money or having a huge savings account. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of women on this call have have kids and have responsibilities. So, how do you guys see it when a founder approaches you and says, "Here's what I'm going to be spending money on, and here is the salary that I will be taking from this round"? Um, Suzanne, do you want to go first? Sure, I can go in. Um, um, I'd say I, we think it's completely acceptable to take a salary um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, not everybody has the luxury of camping out on a friend's couch <laughs> for months or. Uh, I don't know if that's a luxury. <laughs> yeah. I think if you're an entrepreneur or a bootstrapped entrepreneur, it might be. But look, I think the reality is like for the, depending on the founder situation, it's not an option to start the company unless there is a salary. And it, and then I, then my caveat is, and it should be within market for startup founders salary. So, you know, if somebody um, hasn't really launched yet and they're saying, I'm going to pay myself $200,000, I'm going to really like, whoa, okay, no, <laughs> we're not going to go there because some of that money should be used towards getting the company to the next milestone so you can get on your way. Um, but an in-market salary, like I don't blink, you know, if it's between 75 and 125, depending on where you live and kind of where you are in your life, that that doesn't bother us at all. Um, and I, you know, you have to trust the founder that they're not milking the salary when um, they could be putting that money into the company directly. So I think there's a bit of trust, but the reality is we, we know that founders need to take a salary and we are okay with that as long as it's not, you know, egregious. I don't know, Melody, what you think? Yeah, um, we don't actually, it's, it's not like a check box that we check it to, to make sure we ask these questions. I mean, sometimes we see it, you know, when we're digging into like, you know, hey, send me, you know, send me your financial projections. Um, I don't, by the way, like, I don't really care what the financial projection says. I kind of want to see the drivers of the business because most of the time it's going to be wrong, but you know, you'll see the, you'll see the cost build up and we're like, oh, okay, this makes sense. It was like, you know, it's not like, I would say, you know, we've seen C stage company, New York based teams, if you don't have like a mortgage and kids, um, you know, not, and then you're in, you know, kind of like five, 10 years out of your professional career, you know, like 80, 90, hundred K, uh, cash comp. If you're like, you know, a mom with kid and, you know, dual income family, then, you know, you're one of the two incomes, then, you know, hundred K or even 110, that's like totally reasonable. Um, for, for C stage. And obviously as you, as you progress with the business, uh, you should feel free to like talk to your investor or board member to make sure that, Hey, I'm going to adjust my comp and here's why. Um, but you know, people should not be doing this just to like get market comp, uh, for the get like non-founder market comp, um, it, because it's expensive equity points to, to, to do that. Um, so I think we usually trust the founders and it's ha actually hasn't really been much of an issue, um, at all. Good. That, that's great to hear it. Um, let's talk about when to fundraise. So Sue Lynn, you, you've talked a little bit about how fundraising is not a linear 
clear cut process um, like it's written about a lot of times in, in TechCrunch and, and elsewhere. How did you go about determining when it was time to fundraise for your company? Um, always. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I guess I don't know. And I don't know if this was like a, an exact um, question for this panel, but, you know, I, I've had I have two kids, um, one who's one and one who's three. So my family stuff has coincided exactly with the fundraising stuff. So I always tried to time my fundraising accordingly, but it never worked the way that I planned. And that's fine. <laughs> so that is life. That is life. So yeah. So the first angel check I ever got, the first money I ever got, I was like nine months pregnant with my first. Um, and then I closed a fairly large check, like when she was like two months. And I, I really tried to do that before, but it didn't work out that way. And so, I don't know, I think that it's, you know, I think you can plan, but you know, your plans are may not go the way that you thought. And that's fine and really normal as well. That must have been a, a very grueling experience to welcome a newborn, be sleep deprived, be starting a company and then also be talking to investors and fundraising at the same time. Like I, I think it's such an amazing accomplishment um, and a real sign what a badass you are. Well, a lot of people do it. Cause, cause some people yeah. have to like when you have to, I mean, that I feel like that's what makes a good founder is when your back's against the wall, what are you going to do? Can you, you know, can you close on that check even though you have a screaming two month old in the background? <laughs> If you want something to get done, give it to a busy mom. That's uh -huh. true that, true that. Um, Tanya, how did you go about figuring out when to fundraise for Snowball Wealth? Um, well, for us, um, I had brought on a co-founder that um, needed the salary. And so um, for us, we had started off that conversation. And it was actually one of my mentors that um, put down the first check to... Um, and, and I think in terms of thinking through the timing, I definitely suggest avoiding November and December because people, it's just impossible to get on people's schedules. And um, a lot of people are out of office then even more than the summer. Some people talk about the summers being a bad time too. I think that November and December I've found to be more challenging than the summers. Um, and um, so that's how I went about thinking about it. But um, the other piece of advice I'll say around when is to also buffer in the time it takes to actually get your story together um, and a lot of the prep work behind that. So you probably will want to spend at least a month thinking through the story, refining the deck, talking to other founders, um, just doing a lot of research around it before you even take meetings. And I think sometimes we don't think about that as part of the fundraising process, it's, you know, people think about just the meetings, but it's actually a lot of the prep work prior to that. And just thinking through the story, you know, making your introduction more concise, um, making it easy to understand what you, what the problem is, what the solution is. And a lot of that just takes a lot of time. Yeah. And, and during our prep call, you also mentioned that, um, I think you said you schedule something like 10 to 20 meetings per week for four months straight. Uh, which, which is pretty incredible. I mean, talk about like another full-time job. Yeah. And, you know, it was actually a piece of advice that another founder gave me that her goal when she was running the fundraising process and when she got the most momentum was when she had around 20 meetings a week. Um, because then that's when you're in the flow of the pitch, you're, you know, all of the questions are down. Um, and it's just also just easier to get through the rejections. Um, too, because you have another meeting coming up and so you have to recover quickly and get through it. Um, and so you don't really have time to dwell <laughs> and overthink on things. Um, and it's also um, a good time to look at the feedback that you're getting and adjust. I think it's also important to um, take a look at why people are hesitating. And if um, you, know, you get the same hesitation a few times in a row, that's something that you need to adjust for in, in the pitch and in the story too. Yeah, for sure. Um, so something that that we touched on a little bit earlier, and Tanya just kind of brought it up, um, is how COVID has impacted the fundraising process. 
And the reason I bring this up is that normally, you know, we're all out there networking, we're meeting other founders in person, we're rubbing shoulders with investors at events, at, you know, a panel like this, which would have been live. Um, and, and really it's become more challenging in a way to build out that, what, that network. And so when I, Tanya, when I hear you say that you had 10 to 20 meetings scheduled for four months, I'm like, how do you even build out that, that network? And so I would love um, if, if any of you would, would provide some advice on how can these founders go to build out a network um, of who to pitch or who to even talk to during COVID. I can start on that. I, um, so Victor, has, we closed our second fund in June. So we had to do that last bit of fundraising um, right when quarantine started, which is, which definitely was challenging. But I think our, our thinking there was, okay, nobody is going to take a Zoom meeting with us if they don't know us or have some touch point to us. Um, we have to kind of go back to the LPs we already have. So for all of your cases, go back to the friends and family you already know, or the angels you already know, get on the phone with them, give them an update on what's going on, get them excited, and then say, and so who in your network do you think I should connect with? And put it on everybody that already knows you and is excited about you and is backing you, get them to sort of think about who, how to open up their networks for you, because um, it's much easier to take a warm intro in this environment over zoom i think then it's then um and people have do have more time i mean i got rid of my two hour commute and i'm home so the excuse of oh i'm traveling i'm so busy like that's out the window so you know people are <laughs> have more time but i've been binge watching yeah it, it, you know i think i think there is a little bit if, if it's a if it's a connection through, um, again, a warm connection, that's how we raised the last chunk of our fund. And I think without that and really being really thoughtful about our networks and you know, people we had worked with, people that had backed us, co companies, you know, investors in our companies, and we really dug deep to get that last stretch done. Um, so that would be my advice. Like just in co where you can't meet people, go to sort of think of your concentric circles, like who knows you best and then start going out from there and just really ask for the people that know you to make an intro. And then every time you're on a call, ask them for an intro. And before you know it, you can get to those 20 a week if you just kind of go brick by brick. It's a little bit painful, but um, that certainly worked for us as a strategy. I mean, I, I would just add to that, um, you know, even for, so like you, you start with your baseline network, but you always have people, if you execute in your career, you have people who believe in you and you have people, maybe they're not VCs, maybe they're not founders, but they're more senior, more experienced, more connected, and they can vouch. And somehow some of these people will know the right folks in this category. So you, you parlay, I always think about like, you use the resources you have to parlay into something to prove something else out to parlay into something else. Um, you know, one of our, one of the founders that we, we invested in, uh, you know, she's, she has a, she has a really extensive background in tech, but she also did this. Like she started out with, you know, she was a senior exec at jet.com. So she started out and then she was a VP of product at a late stage New York city uh, startup. She started out by getting the founders of these companies and senior exec of these companies to be her angel investors. And then they introduced her to other angel in New York who are founders. And then they started introducing them to the VCs that they've worked with or liked or backed them in the past. And that's like how you parlay into a bunch of these connections. Um, you know, she's probably more connected than a lot of people, but she's a little less connected than a lot of people. So and on the spectrum, there's still a lot of work for her. Um, and I think it's just like something you, you, you try to be creative and resourceful. And, you know, on the warm intro thing, I know like as an industry, you know, I, I'm very conflicted by the notion that we rely on warm intros to do our job. But the reality is that like, I'm just staring at my calendar now. It's like packed with color coded bricks. And so the only way I can actually process through, and I'm like backed up in my email with like 50 young reds. So the, the, the unfortunate reality is that like, that's how we have to parse through things through somewhat of a signal because otherwise we can't get through our days. And that's kind of the reality, unfortunately, 
but the, 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 the challenge there is obviously then, you know, we're not necessarily talking to people who are not within, indirectly within our circle. But I think the way to, you know, the counter argument for like why warm intros, you know, is somewhat of a useful thing is, you know, a lot of times being a founder is a sales job. So it's kind of a, unfortunately, also a test for your resourcefulness. I know it sounds a little bit unfair, but like being a founder is not a normal people job. Normal people don't walk, like run through walls. So you're, you're kind of in this like unfortunate, but then also very challenging position. And I think by being able to get to people through like five parling of the introduction, it proves something that like you can get to places and you can recruit people, you can reach to talent, you can get sales done and you can open doors. So, you know, I'm conflicted, but I also want to kind of provide an alternative point of view on like why and like how sometimes investors think about that, uh, even though on the surface it could be like very unfair or a lot of work or very challenging. Um, yeah, and I'll add to that too, that um, I think it's also important just to stay organized. Different founders have different processes. You know, some people like using a CRM, some people use Streak. I personally just like a Google Sheet and just organizing all of the connectors, all of the people that I've had conversations with, um, and then making sure to follow up because a lot of the connectors that you have are likely founders and they're likely very busy. And so they'll need a nudge, at least one nudge to actually get the conversations going. And, um, and the other piece is that sometimes some investors will respond after you've been introduced twice. So one of a few of the investors that came in, um, you know, I was introduced to one of them a year ago and then you know, another founder brought me up in a conversation and that's when you know, the conversation started to get going. And so I think don't be discouraged if you get a no or a, someone ignores you the first time, but stay um, tenacious and um, make sure to follow up and don't take rejections personally. Or at least try not to. Dylan, do you have any advice that you would like to add here? Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just thinking in this time, actually my team was also mentioning to me how they miss kind of networking events and meeting their peers. And, um, you know, one thing we have done a lot of is apply to accelerators and be a part of programs, which I think now might even be helpful. So we just got into the plug and play insure tech batch this month. And we've been getting a ton of both investor and deal flow inbound from them. Um, and that's really great because it's like structured. And um, so in some ways, maybe the value of accelerators and programs like that may be even higher now because we don't, we can't go to events. Um, and certainly in the past, you know, I, like our first, some of my first angels were because I did a program um, and like won a competition and I got some visibility. And so you never know the value of these things, but um, surely more exposure is better. So, so yeah, there's a lot of, you know, good programs out there. Yeah. Yeah. And of course I wanted to mention all raise. I, I was connected, I'm a mentor and a mentee. And so I was connected to another founder who also made some great introductions that, you know, led to other conversations. And so um, I think all race has been great. The other um, accelerator that I think has been pretty interesting is Stardex and, um, if for the Latinx founders there, there's um, the slave program for um, Latinx founders too. So I definitely, I agree with Celine that like these programs and accelerators definitely help. So, so it seems like um, something that founders should definitely do is to plan way ahead, even more so than you normally would uh, for raising a fund or for raising a, uh, uh, funding for your startup because things can take a little bit longer during COVID in terms of building out the network and, and going through maybe some channels that you would not have considered otherwise. Um, I think uh, some of the things that, that you guys just mentioned is other founders. So connecting with other founders, which can also be done online through there are multiple groups going on. Um, I think mentors is a really good one that has come up multiple times. Uh, mentors can help connect you with other people in, the, in their network. Uh, accelerators, participating in competitions, just basically trying to find uh, a way to get in front of uh, potential 
investors or even angel investors uh, or institutional investors. Um, and then All Raise does have the female founder office hours as well. And uh, we have other programs such as Deal Flow, which we will be telling you more about uh, at the end of session five. Um, so, you know, the thing that I wanted to kind of wrap this up on before uh, we get into our Q&A session is I want to talk about some of the top takeaways that you have for our founders here today. Um, and the way I, I would love for you to think about it is if your best girlfriend was here today and she was an early stage founder raising her first seed, what is some of the top advice that you would want her to know about that she probably will not find anywhere else? Uh, and Suzanne, I'll, I'll have you go first on this one. Oh boy. Um, gosh, the, the advice, it's probably advice she'll find everywhere else, but I think it's the most important thing that we always remind founders of whether we invest them or not is, um, you know, just to, to be ready for rejection and stay positive. Um, and then, you know, do what you do, what you say you're going to do. I know that sounds so simple, but you'd be so surprised how many business plans we see where just out of the gate, they already haven't hit the five things they told you they were going to hit when you check in with them six months later. So I think it's a balance for women. Cause I think stereotypically we undersell ourselves and we undersell where we're headed and like, you know, the, the business plan I might write might show me going from zero to 10 million over five years where stereotypically one of our, my male counterparts might show zero to a hundred. So I think it's a balance of, you know, be strategic and be thoughtful and have a big goal, but, but be able to meet it. Um, because the investors you talk to, unless they are only seed stage investors, and there's few of those, like even fewer of those <laughs> happening. Um, they'll stay in touch with you. So, so for Victorus, we invest in seed and Series A, sometimes a B, but mostly seed and Series A. So I, I like, I love starting conversations with pre-seed rounds because for me, that's a chance to get to know the company. I won't typically invest in pre-seed, but I want to get to know you in pre-seed. But I'm going to watch you and the company for the next six to twelve months until you come up for funding again. And I think taking the time to um, build the relationships with the investors that you want today, but then be thinking of the investors you're going to want in the next round is something that I think founders, um, it's not that you lose sight of it. It's just, there's so many things you have to get done and you want to run your company and put your head down. But I think, you know, being thought, be again, strategic and coming up with a plan that you can achieve and be thinking ahead for the network you need to build to get you to the next round, I think is always, is always smart. Um, yeah, so that's what I got. Thank you for that. Uh, Sulin, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. And um, I think if I was talking to a friend, I'd probably, I'd probably say, well, first of all, you know, the fundraising during COVID playbook is not totally known. Um, so just to acknowledge that. <laughs> and then I loved what Tanya said earlier about the preparation phase. Like, I really do think, you know, when you paint a room, the most time consuming part is like the taping and not the painting, right? And I really do think like practicing your pitch, um, it's like a performance and you don't wanna be practicing in front of the investor. And it may feel really weird to re record yourself or to say it, it does feel really weird, but, or definitely to even, you don't even have to get, um, I mean, it's great to get other founders and investors to hear it and give you feedback, but even just anyone, to give you feedback is still good practice. So I would definitely, um, yeah, get a lot of feedback, but then obviously also be um, filtering all that feedback based on, you know, everyone's coming from their own context and their own kind of um, place. But I think just drawing on, you know, whatever you're building, I'm sure if you're, if you really, really believe in it, really drawing on that authenticity. And then when you get the feedback, make sure you're mapping it onto yourself and not just taking it verbatim because it has to work for you. Um, Actually, yeah. Sulin, that reminds me something that I think you, you mentioned um, earlier, which is when you're pitching, you know, this is the thing that you care the most about. This is something that you're so passionate about. And if that doesn't come across to whomever you're pitching, um, they're just not gonna buy into your story, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean. 
you know, I think you need to really want to do this for many years. And you have this one life and this is how you really want to spend your time. So you got to really want it and you want to try to project that through the Zoom screen, which is really hard. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Tanya, do you want to add, add some feedback as well? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll start off by saying that I think the, the measurement of your company's success shouldn't be tied to how much you've raised. Um, and I absolutely agree with Suzanne to like get ready for rejections and to stay positive, like come up with some routines that help you stay sane and that get you back to, um, and that keep you grounded and, you know, keep you motivated. I think that's really important. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that you really need to view your investors as a part of your team. Like, do you trust them? Do you want them to be a part of your life for the next five years? And if you can't confidently answer that, then I think that you really need to keep looking <laughs> um, and um, and really know that it's a it's a commitment that you're gonna have a say in your business and they're going to be involved and um, and definitely don't take that lightly. For sure. Uh, Melody, what would you what would you tell your best friend who's out there fundraising? Um, you know, so the first, it, it, I would say like my high level advice is like, you want to understand motivations and incentives and psychology um, and VC's business model, because that will help clarify a lot of stuff from why they do certain things, how long it takes them to respond. Why do they want to, you know, do you that you take their rejection letter seriously? So like, I would just kind of always keep that in mind. I usually find it really helpful to understand like someone else's business model. So then I understand like why you're doing certain things. Um, you know, I, I feel like we've talked about fundraising and this is like tough mutter thing that we're about to like go to a race. That's very scary and very, I mean, it's very annoying. I know, like I sometimes joke to my friends, like, investors are annoying for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, but it's like, as a construct of our business model, we're not trying to be annoying. It's a numbers game. Uh, we see thousands, that's why it's like related to not taking it personally. So I, you know, I think just like understanding that, like a lot of this is luck. Like you are competing with six other first meetings that random investor A took. You have no idea who the other five are and you have no idea how that half an hour went. And it could really go to the top or the bottom of the list. And that's it for that one investor. <laughs> so it, a lot of this is just like things that you don't have control of. So I, I think that having that perspective, you're just like, okay, this is just a numbers game. So I just have to have a really robust top of the funnel. And I just need to do the best I can to, you know, really articulate the vision in the market. And some people get the market, some people would not. And some people then build conviction about whether I'm the team to execute. And some people cannot. And, and I'm going to like refine that. And I'm going to like every rejection letter, I'm going to put a filter on because sometimes people are just making stuff up. I try not to make stuff up in my rejection letter because I think that's like counterproductive. Uh, so I usually like, I have my own like log of companies I meet and I try to like keep track of the reasons I said no. And I usually just rebate and show that, share that in the email. Um, the only thing investors do not do, do not share is, oh, we don't really think highly of the team because, you know, you don't want to put that in the email. Uh, but everything else investors should be willing to share. Uh, but, like, you know, like the, the everybody else said in the panel, you just want to, you know, you again, you want to think about why investors do X. And then, uh, and then you can treat that piece of information appropriately. Um, and I, I have one very tactical advice on, on the process and one that's like towards the end of the process. I say it's about psychology because investors are FOMO animals. It's a fear of missing out. Every minute I'm trying to prioritize, when do I take a meeting? So if you can create an environment that makes me feel like if I don't take this meeting in the next 40 hours, or if I don't do work or act on it or take it, take, you know, think about it, prioritizing my time, it's gonna be gone. And I'm going to regret that I didn't do that. Then I will do that. If you get enough investors to do that at the same timeline, roughly, then you create competition. 
once you create competition, you have leverage. If you don't create competition, you have no leverage in two parts. One is co-valuation because you really have no leverage to negotiate. I'm not going to negotiate against myself, right? So two is you don't have leverage against the timeline because people just drag their feet. Unless there's someone else who's moving faster, then everybody can move fast. You know, you're like the, the misnomer in this industry is that, oh, it takes multiple weeks. Like if this thing is going to get done, you know, if I have my first meeting today and if you have two other term sheets, I can get my partners together in 24 or 40 hours of notice and we can make a decision in, in less than a week if we really need to. People can hustle and get work done. So, so I just want to make sure people understand that. But we're, you know, the investors are not going to do that unless they're forced to. So it's really important to think about that and how to manage your process to optimize for a scenario that you have competition. Um, the last thing I'll say, which is actually probably a piece of advice that is not um, common knowledge. If you are in a fortunate situation that you have one or multiple term sheets or investors who are willing to invest, they're going to do reference calls on you. You want to do reference calls on them. And I'm really surprised that most founders don't do this. Um, you know, because like people said, you know, whether this founder, you know, this person or this firm is forever kind of on your cap table. Maybe they're not a board member. Maybe they're board member for only the C stage. We take board C only at a C stage and we step out during A, for example. But it's kind of a long-term relationship. And you, and, and you know, like similar, like how I would do a founder reference, like, hey, give me on list references and I'm going to call up three other people off list. You got to do exactly the same thing. You want to talk to founders who are successful in the portfolio and you want to talk to founders who are not so successful. Be like, how does this person in this firm act when things don't go well, because I guarantee you 99% of the time, it's not a linear path. It's like this, this is how early stage works. And, and you don't want investors who the minute this thing goes down, they abandon ship and never shows up. So, you know, I honestly think that not enough people do that. And you, you to the extent you can, you want to find off list references, you know, founders that this firm has backed that didn't exactly do that and really understand how, you know, that's where characters show. Uh, so that's my advice if you're in a fortunate position. Thank you, Melody. And, and thank you, everyone. Um, we will be talking more about how to raise, how to run the fundraising process in our session three as well. Um, so this is just the beginning of that conversation about how to play that game. Um, but really when it comes, what it comes down to is understanding uh, that, that investors are humans too. They're oftentimes, you know, led by the same decision-making parameters as we are just on the other side. So I think it's really important to understand that perspective. Um, so our, our time is up for the panel. We will be switching gears to our Q and A, uh, 15 minutes of Q and A. Um, it's been lovely to chat with you ladies. Thank you so much. And for everyone out there, I just want to say uh, thank you again for coming. More power to you. I hope that you are successful beyond anyone's imagination. And don't forget to vote. Thank <laughs> you. Hey, thank you all so much. It's been a really great and lively conversation. And everybody's really engaged. We've gotten over 100 questions in the Q&A today. So uh, we're not going to be able to answer all of them. Um, but we will be able to just go through a few of them. Um, one of the ones I wanted to touch on bef before we went on our break earlier was a brown team. There's been a lot of questions. That's a big theme that comes coming up in the, the Q&A around team. Um, specifically, um, you know, what are, you know, what should you look for as you're building your team and what do investors look at when they are looking at team? Also keeping in mind that, you know, we're talking at, you're talking about folks who are underrepresented in a lot of ways, either gender or uh, race, ethnicity, class. So um, how do you, you know, de-risk, I saw someone ask that question, uh, your team, um, and how do you uh, really highlight the positives when you may, you may not have like the pedigree or some of the kind of basic things that people usually think about when they think about team? Um, one thing I'll say um, on my end was that as a business co-founder, I, when I um, went about starting this business, I made sure to look for a technical co-founder um, that would, could come in that would have significant equity 
and that would be committed whether I fundraised or not. And that I think was really, really helpful in the fundraising process and in general for us getting into different incubators. And um, I can share, I can email you. I have a co-founder questionnaire that I came up with as I, as we were deciding this. And then we also had a, um, I, I really treated that as another process too, in terms of like recruiting a technical co-founder, interviewing them, doing a project with them. But I think that for the business founders here, I think it's, um, important and also possible to have a technical co-founder. Like you don't have to spend your pre-seed money or your angel money on engineers. You can also bring on a technical co-founder. There are a lot of people out there that are excited to take some time off of work and build a company with you. Um, so it is possible. I wanted to put that out there too, which I think was really helpful for us. Um, I, I can add to that. You know, I think I still go back to like, okay, this this particular business I want to start. Um, what are the superpowers that are really going to change the trajectory of this? Is it product? Is it sales? Is it go to market? Is it brand? And what do I have or not have by people looking on my LinkedIn resume? LinkedIn. So here are the holes I'm going to plug, and there are two ways to plug it. One is called like giving founder equity. Two is called hiring, right? You know, I actually think that when investors, the founding team is important because they, you want the major pillars in. I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, we we had a founder come in to pitch. This is one of the, this is a founder that my partner has been tracking for a long time. I'll call him a business founder. He wants to do something in the AR space, um, kind of, you know, projecting some kind of platform shift and we want to build an AR app and a marketplace type thing with, pretty unique user experience. And he doesn't have a have co-founder slash head of product and he's not a product person. And I actually did not like that deal because I was like, I think one of the things that you need here is really strong product shop. And this is not like generic product shops. Like, oh, I built checkout flow and e-commerce experience. This is like really deep consumer product background because you're trying to reimagine a user experience in a product of a kind of a paradigm shift way that I, so like, if I would be really supportive and excited about this deal, this is a pre-product team, uh, pre-product company. And then, you know, what ended up happening is this, this guy I found, he's like, oh, I found my product guy. And this product guy didn't turn out to be the type of profile that we thought he need for this company that he's working on. So we're like, hmm, now we don't have as much conviction because that tells you a lot. That tells you one, your judgment to how you're gonna be set up from day one and, but this is like a very, like how we look at it is like, we're, we're looking at this very specific business that this team is trying to tackle. And we're trying to figure out what are the superpowers that might need to like change the trajectory. So, I, so that's how I would think about it um, in the founder shoes when it both comes to like rounding out the co-founder team, founding team, as well as hiring. Uh, and if you are going the hiring route, you know, what I usually tell people, regardless which stage of you know, fundraising you're at, you want to project that, hey, I have candidates, they're ready to join. And so it's, you know, I'm going to be able to close them as soon as I have money in the bank. And that's the best case scenario. People are always like, oh, do I need to this person start? I was like, you don't really need to, but you need to tell me three candidates that are like in your pocket that you're in late stage conversations with. So I have confidence that this team will be complete. And I can also get a sense of your judgment on, on talent and your ability to attract talent. Uh, so I also think that that's a way to like bootstrap the progress, so to speak, on a team front without actually committing the cash um, and be able to communicate with investors how you think about building the team. I, I would also just add, I think, and Melody kind of touched on this, but I feel like, you know, your ability to convince a high caliber person to dedicate their precious time to work with you is a really good sign of how how much your idea has legs and how good you are at selling it and how compelling you are. Um, so I, I think there are some great solo entrepreneurs, but I think if you're finding, you know, that it's hard to convince someone to work with you on this, you might want to just think about the feedback that you're getting and like, why, why is it hard to get someone to, um, to work with you? And because for sure, the best co-founders are people who have a ton of other options. Mm -hmm. So you have to convince them that this is the best thing. 
Thanks. Um, another question that uh, caught my eye or a couple of questions were really around the theme of how do you address and maybe overcome some of the unconscious bias that can take place in the fundraising process. So if someone asked about, you know, being pregnant in fundraising or, you know, fundraising with a significant other, um, can you talk a little bit about things like that? Hmm. Right, I'll share a story. When we were fundraising, it's probably our third meeting. Uh, so my my other, other managing partner, Victorus, and I combined to have eight kids between the two of us. And um, both of our husbands are in private equity. So we it was like our third meeting. And this guy who had been in private equity was took the meeting because um, he does seed first-time funds. And his second question was, well, what do your husbands think about this? <laughs> and I was so not ready for that because I, I just, I was like, it was so completely no I was not ready for it so I sort of laughed I said well they're excited what does your wife think about your job <laughs> like I just was so you know but um so I guess it, it's gonna happen you're gonna get those questions I had another woman that asked me oh is this really what you're doing or is this sort of a hobby and that was a woman asking me so I think the I don't know. I always, I, I err towards humor. Um, I guess it's sort of my default. So I always try to sort of make a joke and then get right back to point like, um, no, this is what we're doing. We spend 80 hours a week doing this and here's what we've done. And here's why you should have no doubt. I, I kind of move the message, but I always, um, it's going to have, you are going to get questions that you just can't believe exist in 2020. Well, maybe you can, depending on <laughs> what news you watch, but anyway, <laughs> But also, should that be a signal for you as a founder? And what does that say about the investor? And do you actually want to work with them? I think that I think that mm -hmm. there are some people who just literally are not aware, maybe. I don't know if they've been living under a rock and just are used to their own ways. Um, but I think the in the longer term, like we've been talking about, this is a long-term relationship. And, you know, if anything happens, um, like, for example, I during my first pregnancy, I ended up having uh, a three month stay in a hospital before my, before my son was born. And all of my investors could not have been better and more supportive about it. They were telling me to get off my computer. Um, would that have been the case with any other investor? Probably not. But I think that life throws you these curveballs and it's so important to really think about who you want to be on your side when that stuff happens. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um, I'll just say that I think that it's important not to get discouraged by comments like that and um, to stay positive because I think it's easy to focus on all of the people that don't want you to succeed and then don't want you to get funded. But I think it's more important to focus on the people that do want you to succeed and to focus on the believers um, and not focus as much energy on the skeptics, which is much easier said than done. But I think that um, it's just really important to focus on the people that um, are the supporters. And so when I went about my fundraising process this time around, I did make, because our platform is focused on women, um, as our go to market, I did focus on um, women investors. And so, um, and I think that, no, I don't regret that. And I'm really happy about the people that we have on board. All right. Um, some other questions that we've seen here. Um, there's a, some talk about uh, how many meetings founders take during the week when they're fundraising, but for the VCs, how many, you know, what's your funnel look like? How many meetings do you usually take with founders? Um, and, you know, what's the ratio of like meetings to investments? I, I can go. I literally stare at my Google Calendar here. Uh, and I color post stuff, so actually easy for me to see. Uh, so, um, just use this week as an example. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine first calls, like top of the funnel. And that's not even some, some, some introductions or outreach don't turn into calls. Um, so 
that's like step two of the funnel already. Um, you know, zoom that out. At NextView, we do as a firm, we have four partners, including myself. As a firm, we do 10 to 12 investments a year. So that means each partner does two to three investments a year. Um, I already done three investments a year this year. I mean, it's, there's no like strict quota per se, that's just kind of a running average. So I could be doing one other investment for the remaining of the year or zero or probably not two because I might not have bandwidth that is already October 5th. Um, but that's just kind of like a rough and like, you know, so as a firm, we probably take like 40 first meetings amongst four of us. And maybe we talk about like three interesting companies comes Monday um, and kind of goes on. But that's just kind of, rare. and that does not include, this is why like, VC is kind of a numbers game because from the founder's perspective, because we have portfolio companies, we have board meetings, we have internal, we're preparing for our annual meetings to manage, you know, to give report back to our investors. We were just fundraising. And, and so there's a lot of other stuff that goes on um, that's not first meetings. And then in between first meetings, I gotta have time to think and then do work and diligence if I'm like serious about any of these other, uh, any of the companies I've met, so. Yeah, I would say ours, ours is, so our process, we have a, a vice president who's wonderful. Um, and we've set it up where she's sort of the first eyes on everything. And that's really because uh, Lori and I try to split things up. And sometimes we both, um, we, we'll let Madeline be, she, her name is Madeline Kulin. She's great, but she's kind of the gatekeeper of everything. Everything flows in through her. And um, because there's just no, there's like Melly saying, there's just not enough hours in anybody's week to take a call on every single thing that comes in. So we need some sort of way to flow from the top to the next level and, and Madeline's a good eye on that. She can make sure it's the right stage. She can make sure it fits within our wheelhouse because some founders reach out not, not knowing what, what we invest in. So that's kind of like you start way up here, which is everybody. And the next level down is typically a first call with Madeline. And if things still check out where it's within our um, wheelhouse of what we look at and invest in, then she'll present at a weekly deal meeting to Lori and I. Um, depending on what piques our interest, we'll then do a follow-up call and, and Lori or I, or both of us sometimes get involved and then you kind of start down the funnel. But statistically, I mean, I think on average, I don't know, like less than 5% of deals and that's probably high. So I don't know, two to 3% of, um, of deal flow actually gets done at the end of the day. And like Melly saying, there's like 50 reasons that could happen. It could be this, whatever psychology, whatever my mindset is on that Monday meeting is where I'm going to say, yeah, let's take a call. Or, no, that's not that interesting. But like 50 things go through my head in those five minutes. And so, you know, having to take a hundred calls to get five investors doesn't mean that 95 thought you were terrible. It just means at that moment in time, when they had that five minute window to decide if they were going to put work into it for whatever reason, they said no. Um, so keep going because it really is a volume game. You, you've got to get to 100, honestly, statistically to get to five investors in the end. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that that is all we have time for. I think there's, a, well, I have one quick one, Tanya, for you. If folks wanted to know what was the name of the Latinx accelerator that you mentioned before. Oh yeah, it's the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Program. And I think they linked it in the Q&A box okay. too. Yeah, but those, the two I mentioned are um, equity free, which are great. And they still provide you connections to investors. All right, well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, this has been great. Thanks, this is our first session. We'll be back next week for session two on what makes a great story and a deck. And we will be moving into breakout sessions for those who want to join us. So there'll be another link. Uh, I think it was uh, linked out in the chat. And uh, for those of you who want to join us for that, we will see you in the next uh, breakout soon. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you.